Good morning. We are today in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet, quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. When I first came to the U.S., to attend college, I had a very clear plan in my mind. I was going to come here, get my degree, go back to Mexico, take over my dad's company, get rich, get married, be happy. That was the plan. <laughs> Straight to the point. Um, my plan was never to stay here. This was just a stop on my uh, uh, path to this bright future in Mexico City. And at that time, of course, I was not a believer. And I was counting on my own ability and my own effort. And of course, my family's resources to accomplish my goals, to make my dreams come true. I thought I had everything figured out, but things didn't work out the way I thought. As soon as I arrived to the US to begin my uh, sophomore year, because I transferred from Mexico City. My family imploded. My parents got divorced, and with their divorce, all my cash flow just eroded. Nothing worked out the way I was expecting it. So money was coming in, was not coming in, because my dad had new financial priorities, and those priorities did not include my mom or my brother or me. So, as you can imagine, this began a period of major instability and difficulty that lasted several years for us. And throughout those years, I continued to rely on my own strength and my own ability to make things happen, to solve problems that we had, and to give strength to my mother and my brother who looked up to me for these things, even though I was you know, in my very early 20s. And, and I had no real hope for deliverance or, 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 or any um, reprieve from my problems. I was a godless young man who was oblivious of his spiritual condition. And, and, and I was like, uh, it, was a, it was a goat wandering in the wilderness, facing these dark, dangerous paths, alone and defenseless. But I didn't know that. And it was only when things got really rough, really desperate, that I would pray to God, but the problem is that I was praying to a God that I had never met, a God I did not know, a God I did not have a relationship with whatsoever. But I was desperate, and I had nowhere else to go, so I thought, I'll just give it a shot. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? But in His infinite grace and mercy, the Lord showed me, little by little, how wrong I was in my plans for conquering the world and how powerless I am to do anything aside from him. Soon after my graduation, the Lord showed me that he had a better plan. And he began by bringing me here to Dallas, Texas to take a job in elementary school. And he put me in this path of elementary school teaching. I was supposed to be a power player in the industrial sales uh, uh, field. But the Lord said, no, I'm going to make you a kindergarten teacher. And that's where you're going to start. <laughs> so then he introduced me to my beautiful, godly wife, who led me to the Lord, led me to some of the men that have mentored me through the years. And she led me to this congregation. And it was through those blessings that the Lord began transforming my life and by his grace, I am no longer a goat. I am a sheep. And the Lord Jesus is my shepherd. I belong to his flock. I belong to the Father. I am his child. So he has called me here today to serve him 
and serve you. And now he has given me the task and the privilege to bring in you this message. The shepherd has called me here, and that's, that's how I got here. So one of these days I want to start traveling, so I have better anecdotes to tell you when I go to Israel and all these things. But for now, this, this is what I have to rely on my own experiences. So let's look at this psalm, Psalm 23. This psalm was written by David, and it's probably, as you know, the most studied and beloved psalm in the entire Bible. Uh, in this psalm, David does not partic- uh, uh, record any particular or special event. There are no prayers. There are no requests for relief. There are no pleads uh, uh, for deliverance from any specific crisis. There is no uh, complaints or no laments of any kind. This psalm is simply a meditation on everything that God does for those who belong to him. It is a thanksgiving to the Lord who is the source of every good gift, who is the source of every blessing. That's what we have in this psalm. Now, when you read this psalm, you realize that this is a profoundly beautiful, sweet, and comforting text. And that's why it is quoted by many people, including those who do not really belong to the Lord. And you cannot blame them for quoting this psalm because... The, the, the heart of an unbeliever, as I was before, is always restless. And it is always restless because their heart is at war with the Creator. Those who have not trusted in Christ for their salvation, those who have not been born again, those who have not been regenerated in their hearts, are at enmity with, with God. They have no peace and they have no joy. But they want it, and they desperately seek it. And they go everywhere looking for this, except that they won't find it if they don't find it in the Lord. And while we do not know the date nor the setting of this psalm, um, we do know that David is the one who wrote it. And his purpose was to express his faith in God, to express his trust and his confidence in Him. So. Uh, this psalm has, since it's written in, in, in such a general way, there are many applications that you have probably heard. So this one that I'm going to give you today is just what I see in this text. Uh, the text allows for several different applications. But back to the psalm, this is divided into sections, and each one of these sections is, describing, is using a, a metaphor to describe the Lord and His goodness. So the first metaphor can be found in verses 1 through 4. In this, in this metaphor, the Lord is portrayed as a shepherd who cares for his sheep. And then the second metaphor is going to be in verses 5 and 6, where the Lord then is described as a generous host who has prepared this lavish banquet. And it is through these two metaphors that David is going to meditate on how the Lord provides for all of his needs, whether they are spiritual or material. So let's look at verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This verse begins by introducing the subject of the entire psalm, the Lord. In this first half of the psalm of David, he would speak about him. He would speak about God. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord makes me lie down. The Lord leads me. The Lord restores my soul. The Lord guides me. It's talking about him. But then in the second part of the psalm, David, David switches to talk to him. He addresses the Lord. He says, you are with me. You comfort me. You prepare me. You anoint me. I will dwell in your house. So that's how this psalm is going to flow. Now, in, in 1 Samuel 16, and you just saw that th- this uh, morning, you see that David was the youngest of eight siblings, eight brothers. And David himself was a shepherd. Now, at that time in history, shepherding was usually assigned to hirelings or slaves. And most commonly, like in David's case, it was assigned, this, this task was assigned to the youngest uh, uh, son. So David is the, was a shepherd. And the shepherd was in charge, of course, of leading the sheep to pasture and water. 
and he was in charge of protecting the sheep from predators and from robbers. And this could be done whether they were out, out in the open or in the, in the sheepfolds. And then when they came to the sheepfold, the, the, the shepherd was in charge of being counting the sheep to make sure everybody made it back to the fold. And in some cases, when the sheep were sick or wounded, the shepherd would carry those in his arms all the way back home. So that's, in a nutshell, what the shepherd's uh, uh, duties were. So this metaphor of the shepherd, of course, is not unique to this psalm. As a matter of fact, different cultures throughout the ancient Near East portrayed kings as shepherds. And that's the case here in the Old Testament. There are several different passages throughout the Old Testament, like Ezekiel 34, uh, verse 2, where Israel's leaders, those who were in charge of leading and protecting and teaching the word of God to the people, they are referred as shepherds. And as the people or the sheep receive this teaching, receive this instruction and this guidance, they will grow in the faith. So this metaphor of the shepherd can also be clearly seen in the New Testament. In the Gospel of John, in chapter 21, verse 16, Jesus instructs Peter, feed my sheep. And then in 1 Peter, chapter 5, Peter instructs the elders uh, to shepherd the flock. So, in other words, the leaders of the church are called to protect God's people, to teach them, and to guide them. So, for example, the elders here at Believer's Chapel, they protect the congregation from heretical teaching by vetting those who are invited to teach and by monitoring what has been said during the Lord's Supper. And they also make sure that the biblical instruction that you receive from the pulpit or any other of the classrooms here is true to the Bible. So the elders at Believer's Chapel guide this congregation through their teaching, through their ex uh, example, and through their counsel. Now, back in our text, in many cases, as it was with David, the sheep were the property of the shepherd. In general, most of these animals had to be purchased, and they were purchased at a great cost to the shepherd. Remember, these are not wild animals that you could just gather in the wild and then bring them with you home. These sheep had to be purchased. This is why the sheep were very valuable to the shepherd. There was a great cost associated with acquiring them. And David clearly understood his position and his relationship before God. Here, the Hebrew word roi, correctly translated as my shepherd, can also be translated as my feeder or my protector. So I'm, I'm telling you this because this gives you a better idea of where David is going. In this psalm, David compares himself to these foolish, weak, and defenseless creatures that are the sheep who are totally dependent on the shepherd. David recognizes that God is his provider, he is his protector and his guide. In other words, just as David was everything for his sheep, God is everything for David. So he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He is my protector. He's my feeder. He's my guide. He's everything to me. Now, in this verse, I also want to call your attention to the possessive pronoun, my. The importance of this pronoun lies in the fact that it demonstrates an intimate personal association in the present, okay? It's, a, it's an association, a relationship in the present with the shepherd, which is the Lord. There is no if, there is no but, if this is not conditional, this is not a hope, this is David's present reality. For example, every week when I go watch my kids play sports, there are fields and fields littered with children running around. But among all those children, only two are my children. And then in those fields full of children running around, there are also plenty of wives, women carrying their you know, big, massive uh, 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 bottles of water. Everybody's carrying one, but from all those women that are there, from all those wives, only one is my wife. 
They belong to me. I belong to them. I have papers to prove it. That's our reality, whether they like it or not. <laughs> so David says here, the Lord is my shepherd. I belong to him. I have a spiritual relationship with him. And it is because of this relationship that I have with the Lord that I can say, I shall not want. In this sentence, the phrase, the Hebrew phrase, lo esar, translated, is translated as I shall not want. But it also can be translated as I lack nothing. That's what Psalm 3410 that Chris just read, uh, uh, written by David, says. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they who seek the Lord shall not be in want of anything. Those who seek the Lord shall lack nothing of any good thing. So with this phrase, in both cases, in both Psalms, David is implying that he does not lack anything that is necessary. They, uh, this shepherd of which David is speaking is able and willing to provide all the needs of David. Any need that he may have, God will provide for him. David lacks nothing. God's provision is abundant and it is unparalleled. Now, this of course does not mean that David would get absolutely everything he, he asked for. He was not going to get every desire of his heart. David not, may not have owned everything he wanted, but he had exactly what he needed, a relationship with God. He had a spiritual relationship with, Lord, with the Lord. Jesus said in Mark chapter 8, verse 36, What does it profit a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul? A personal relationship with God gives contentment to the heart of the believer because it is infinitely better than all the material possessions in the world. That's what David is saying, and that's what is being reiterated in the Gospel of Mark. David continues in verse 2 saying, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. As I mentioned before, the shepherd was in charge of leading the sheep to pasture and water. And in Israel, green pastures were a seasonal phenomenon that only occurred in the winter and in the spring. And this meant that the rest of the year was a little bit of a struggle to find pasture. So the shepherd had to be constantly seeking, going from one place to another in order to find the best places to feed his flock and the best places to drink. But regardless of the personal toll, regardless of the personal sacrifice, the, the, the shepherd loves his sheep and he wants them to thrive. So he went wherever it was necessary, wherever it was necessary in order to provide for his beloved sheep. In this verse, the phrase, he makes me lie down in green pastures, implies that in this place where the shepherd has brought the flock, the grass is tender, the grass is green, and it is abundant. Here the sheep can eat until they are completely satisfied, and they can rest until they are fully restored from, the, from their travels. And just as this grass is food for the sheep, the inerrant word of God and his provision are spiritual food for the human soul. Here in verse 2, David is confirming by personal testimony that God is truly at work in his life. God satisfies David's spiritual needs with the best spiritual food that there is, the scriptures. It is through David's meditation upon them and through the teaching ministry of the priests uh, 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 and, and other saints and other people that are ministering to his heart that that. Uh, that the Lord fills David's heart with satisfaction and contentment, with rest and peace. And in this section right here, we see once again how critical it is for us to spend time reading the Bible and meditating on it. So let me ask you, you don't have to answer, you don't have to nod, but I just want to ask you, and you respond in your mind, 
Do you open your Bible every day? Do you spend your day or parts of the day, however brief, thinking about God's word? Because this is how our soul gets fed and refreshed. Imagine if you, were, uh, if you went a day without food, what would happen then? But now imagine a week, imagine a month, imagine a couple months. You'll be too weak, you'll be too tired without eating. So it is the same with our soul. We need to be fed by the word of God. The scriptures remind us who God is. It reminds us of his promises and it comforts us in times of trouble like the ones we're going on right, are going on right now. Back in our text, after a hearty meal, the shepherd would lead the flock to a watering place. And this would not be a fast uh, uh, flowing river or a rushing stream. This would be a place where the water would be calm and still. Think about like a pond or a small lake. Um, and you might ask, well, why, why is that? I mean, like rushing waters is really not a problem for a sheep. Well, the problem is that throughout their journey, the sheep would get dirty, as you would imagine. And in some cases, they would get cuts and scratches that needed to be cleaned. So the purpose of calm waters was twofold, to drink and to clean, the, to drink and to clean the sheep's cuts and wounds. So the point that David is making here is that the Lord cleanses his people from sin and provides them with spiritual refreshment and renewal from the trials and the challenges of everyday life. This is why I was posing this question about reading the scriptures constantly, because this is how the Lord brings refreshment and renewal from the difficulties of everyday life. David reiterates this same point in the first part of verse 3, saying, He restores my soul. So this verb in Hebrew that is translated as he restores conveys the idea of returning something to its original state. And as I mentioned in the previous verse, whenever the sheep were wounded or sick, the shepherd would, would nurse them back into health. So when David says, he restores my soul, he means that the Lord restores him to his proper spiritual and physical condition. When David was weary and sorrowful, the Lord restored him through rest and refreshment. And when David fell into sin, the Lord restored him through repentance, forgiveness, and sanctification. And this restoration of his relationship with the Lord brought him back the enjoyment of life. Then in the second half of verse 3, David continues with this metaphor of the shepherd saying, he guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We have already established that the shepherd loved his sheep, and therefore he provided the best for them. So the shepherd guided them to the best places where the best food through the best routes. And just as the sheep trusted in, in their shepherd on their way to their destination, David trusted God to guide him and protect him throughout his life, throughout this journey of life. And since God was not physically there so that David could see him and hear him and follow him, God used different circumstances in David's life. He used the scriptures, he used the priests and other ministers to guide David where God wanted David to be. Back in those days in Israel, the namesake of, or, or the reputation of a shepherd depended greatly, as you would expect, in the shepherd's ability to lead the flock and to take them in the right direction. And, 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 and needless to say, if you, ha if you were a shepherd and you had the reputation of losing sheep or not being able to find your way home, you would qu quickly be deemed useless and unemployable. So that's the namesake was a very important thing for the shepherd, and it is for us today as well. So the point that David is making here is that God is in absolute control of his life. It was God himself who determined where David would go. And since God is holy, righteous, and just, God always led David in the right way. He led him through the paths of righteousness. God knows all things. Therefore, he never loses his way anywhere. God sees all things, therefore he never loses his people. He always brings everybody home safely. 
God leads in the right way for his namesake. In other words, God leads his people in the right way because that is his character, because that's who he is. That is his nature. He is sovereign in everything he does. And David is demonstrating that fact when he says that the Lord makes him lie down, that he leads, that he restores, that he guides. It is God who decides. It is God who initiates, who causes, who provides, who delivers. It's all God. Everything that God does, everything that God gives is out of his infinite, perfect love and faithfulness. It's out of his pure, free grace. He's not forced to do that. We don't make him do it. He gives because he wants. And because David is certain of God's faithful and abundant provision, he can confidently say, I shall not want. The Lord says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. David concludes the metaphor of the shepherd in verse 4, saying, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. David was born in Bethlehem, which is located in the hill country of Judah. This area of southern Israel contains many narrow uh, uh, and steep ravines, and, and, and there are many like V-shaped valleys here with like a valley on the bottom and, and, and very steep V-shaped uh, uh, walls and canyons that are difficult to ascend and descend. It's, it's a difficult terrain. And this land also has a very good number of uh, dark and scary caves. So this terrain, as you can imagine, is perfect for uh, wild animals and thieves to, to make their abode. And this is the area where David was shepherding his sheep. And perhaps this is what David has in mind when he's writing this verse. So here, the Hebrew noun, salmavet, is the strongest word that there is in Hebrew to describe darkness. There are different passages in the Old Testament where this word is used to describe thick darkness, like the thick darkness in a, in a mine shaft, shaft or, or the darkness of the abode of death, or the darkness prior to creation. And then emotionally, this word describes the internal anguish of one who has rebelled against God. It's a very strong word that David is using here to describe darkness. In the New American Standard, in the English Standard, and the King James, the phrase, Begay Salmavet, is translated as the valley of the shadow of death. However, the New International Version and some others translate this same phrase as darkest valley. They're both very, very uh, good translations, and, and there are some others that may say a valley of deep shadow. Either one of those translations is accurate, either those tra of those translations is great. Because in either case, the main ideas of deep darkness and death remain. David is using this phrase to give a vivid description of a place of extreme danger. A place where the very lives of the travelers were threatened. That is the magnitude of this passage, of this word. It's a place of extreme danger. And what I want you to notice here is that David is walking. He's not running. He is walking through the valley of the shadow of death. I suppose that if any one of us here had to travel through a place of extreme danger, a place where your life is going to be most certainly in danger, we would run through it. So think about this. Let's say that you are in a dark alley in New York City after midnight, and you see three guys coming toward you, and you can notice that these guys are armed with a gun or with a knife. You would not just go and say, hey, what's going on, guys? What are you doing? No. You're going to look the other way, and you're going to run as fast as you can. That's what we're talking about here. But David is not doing that. David not, does not run. He's not alarmed. He's not petrified by fear. Instead, he is calmed. He is composed. And he steadily walks through this dangerous path because he knows exactly where he is. He knows exactly where he is going. 
He knows exactly where this road leads, however scary or dark it may be. David knows that this valley is not his destination. David is just passing through. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said about this particular verse. Quote, we do not die. We do but sleep to wake in glory. Death is not the house, but the porch. Not the goal, but the passage to it." End quote. Another thing that I want us to see here is that this is not the valley of death. David calls it the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Because for the believer, death in its substance has been removed and only its shadow remains. Again, Spurgeon explains this way better than I can do. Let me, let me read this quote. Death stands by the side of the highway in which we have to travel. And the light of heaven shining upon him throws a shadow across our path. Let us then rejoice that there is a light beyond. Nobody is afraid of a shadow, for a shadow cannot stop a man's pathway even for a moment. The shadow of a dog cannot bite. The shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy us. Let us not, therefore, be afraid. When David says, I fear no evil, for you are with me, he's not saying that he did not feel any fear whatsoever. That's not at all what he's saying. We know that David was afraid. He does feel fear. What David is saying is that as he follows his shepherd through these dangerous and dark places, he would overcome his fears, and he would do so by focusing his sight on the shepherd and on the rod and on the staff that he carries. The rod was a relatively sm small, short, uh, uh, heavy club that was used as a weapon, it was used to hit, you know, like the baton that uh, the police officers carry. And then the staff was a longer piece of wood. Um, and it would have a, a, a hook or a crook in one end. And this was used primarily to, to, to be used as support when, when the shepherd was walking. But it could also be the hook. Could it be also be to, to pull the sheep from you know, the thicket or wherever they were in a mud pit. So it had a couple of purposes. But mainly it was to just help him as he was walking. But in either case, both the rod and the staff could be used to defend the sheep from wild animals and even thieves. But of course we know that God doesn't use a physical rod or a staff. These are just symbols that David was using to describe the care and the protection he receives from God. What David is saying here is that he's comforted by the knowledge that he is under the protection of his shepherd. David is certain that even in the darkness, uh, darkest, scariest, most desolate and dangerous places, in the most difficult and painful of situations, God is always there with him. David is not alone. He's able to face this darkness, not because he's brave and strong, but because God is with him. I fear no evil, for you are with me, says David. Then, Again, as I already mentioned, all blessings come from the Lord. And sometimes these blessings include the testing of our faith through different trials. Have you ever experienced the loss of a loved one? Have you experienced health issues? Have you lost a job or a relationship? Whatever difficulty you may go through or you may be going on right now, you must be encouraged by David's words here. Because you're not alone. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God is right beside you and he will see you through. Now, before I move on to the second part of this psalm, I would like to make a point that I think is essential to fully understand this psalm. I believe that the key to the psalm is in the opening sentence in verse 1 where it says, The Lord is my shepherd. The rest of the text depends entirely on this opening sentence. Now, we all know that today, around the world, there are millions of people who believe in a God, that, that they are guided by this particular God, and this God is their protector, and it's a provider, as if there were many of them to choose from. 
But David was not talking about a God out of many. David was talking about the one and only triune God, creator and sustainer of the universe. David was talking about the only shepherd that there is, the Lord Jesus Christ. David may not have known the specifics of the Messiah's ministry. He may not have known his name, but he did know and believe that one day this Messiah would come just as God had promised back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And the Messiah did come. Listen to what the Lord Jesus said in the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a higher hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay my, down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep, which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. So you see here, the Lord Jesus Christ is the shepherd of whom David speaks in this psalm. The flock, the sheep, are all those genuine believers, those who have been born again, those who have trusted in Christ and Christ alone for their salvation. Only those of us who have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ have received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have received the right and the privilege to call him my God, my Father, my Savior, my Shepherd. But if you're here without Christ and you have not believed that he died on the cross, to pay for your sins. If you don't believe in Christ alone for your salvation, you're a, you're a goat, like I was, not a sheep. You're an enmity with God. You're not a child of His. You do not belong to Him, and only those who bear the indelible mark of the Holy Spirit have access to all the benefits and the privileges that God offers through faith in His only begotten Son. So if you're here without Christ, you need a Savior. You need to turn to Him today. Because it is God who satisfies our every need, both spiritual and material. Notice I said every need, not every want or every desire. Those are two different things. Do you, do you think you need a better job? Do you think you need a better house, a newer car, more money in the bank, even better health? Well, you may not get it. Sometimes the Lord withholds things from us. Sometimes the Lord makes us go through difficulty and danger. But it is always for a reason that we have seen in, in Peter and in James. There is a reason for our trials and our suffering. It is always for our benefit. Everybody knows, maybe except Mike, that kids like sugar. And they would have it all day if they could. Right? I mean, that's, that's what they could eat morning, evening, and every, any time. But you and I know that that's not what they need. It's not what it is best for them. And as a parent, sometimes you have to say, no. And your child is not going to understand it, and they're going to cry, and they're going to be hurt, because they don't know any better, but I do. I know this is not good for you, so I have to say no. And that's how the Lord operates as well. Every believer must remember that there is no situation that God does not control. There is no corner of the universe that God cannot see. There is not a sound that he cannot hear, and there is not a question that he cannot answer, or there is not a problem he cannot solve. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows your situation because he put you there, and he's there with you at every step. And he will deliver you in his time, in his own way. 
Here, this concludes the metaphor of the shepherd where David was talking about God. And now we transition to the second part of the verse uh, of the psalm, the last two verses, where David now is going to talk directly to God. And now he uses a different metaphor. And in this metaphor, the imagery changes from a shepherd to a host and then from a pastor to a banquet, banquet hall. So the Lord is now portrayed as a generous host who has prepared a lavish bank, banquet for David. So verse 5 says, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This table, this banquet, was prepared for David. He's the guest of honor. Now, it is impossible for us to determine what kind of banquet this is that David is describing, whether it's a hospitality banquet or a Thanksgiving banquet. It doesn't matter what it is. The point here is that God is a hospitable and generous host. And this generosity is implied by this phrase, you prepare. This verb is written in an imperfect tense, which represents a future action or a constant or continuous uh, uh, action. And the point here is that David is saying that God is continually providing from him, for him, in this case, drink and food at the table. Now, what does David imply when he says that this is done in the presence of his enemies? Well, according to the customs of the day, when you had a guest in your house, you were responsible for their protection at all costs from whatever enemies were following after this person. So what David is saying here is that even though his enemies are at the door, he could sit down and eat and drink in absolute peace, knowing that God provides sustenance and safety now and in the future. David continues in verse 5 saying, you have anointed my head with oil. This is a sign of, of uh, when somebody came to your house and you gave them oil. This is the same thing as when they come into your guest bathroom and they find these fine soaps and these lotions that smell really nice. You're trying to demonstrate that these people are special. You're honoring them. That's what David is saying. He's been honored by the Lord. He, th he is special to him. And the phrase, my cup overflows, signifies that the, 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 the Lord has ab abundantly supplied everything he needs, much more than what he needs. God has given David nothing but the best in such abundance that the cup overflows. And now having reflected upon all these blessings that David has received, he concludes in verse 6 saying, Surely goodness and loving, uh, loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This word hesed, you probably have heard it many times. It can be translated in, differ in different uh, ways. Loving kindness, loyal love, faithfulness, mercy, or simply love, depending on the translation that you have. And all of those are correct. All of those are um, attributes of God. His goodness is demonstrated in the abundance, in the abundance of his blessings, in his provision. God pr promotes and, and, and protects everything that is good because he himself is the standard of good. And then his chesed, his, his, uh, his love is expressed in the actions in the promises to his people. James chapter 1, verse 17 says, Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Everything that is good comes from the Lord. And David is rightfully convinced that God will be with him throughout his life and that one day David will go dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And in this place, David shall spend the rest of eternity in the presence of God, worshiping him and having fellowship with him. But if you're here without Christ and you have not trusted in him alone for your salvation, none of what I just explained applies to you. You're an enemy of the shepherd. You're walking through the wrong path. You dwell in darkness away from the light of the Savior. You're an enmity with God. And this enmity with God makes you joyless and restless and fearful. Your cup overflows with condemnation and wrath. And if you were to die in your sins right now, without Christ, you will dwell in the lake of fire forever. And worst of all, there is nothing that you can do to save yourself from such destiny. Because your works and your sacrifices and your generosity toward others cannot save you. What you need is a savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can make you born again, 
He is the only one that can replace your heart of stone for a heart of flesh. He is the only one who can give you spiritual life, and he's the only one that can send the Holy Spirit to indwell in you. Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And then Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, leading to righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, leading to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes upon him will not be put to shame. For there, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you are here without Christ, the time is running out. So let this be the day of your salvation. Let this be the day and the time when you come to Christ to receive the free gift of salvation because he receives all who come to him. He rejects nobody. So come to him. And for us who can confidently say that the Lord is my shepherd, remember his promises. He said he will never leave us or forsake us. No matter the place, no matter the situation, in the darkest dark, or, or, or the deepest deep, he is there with us. He sees, he hears, and he knows what his children need. The Lord always provides, he always keeps his promises, so trust in him. If you could please stand, we're going to sing hymn number 42 in the Songs of Praise. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Hymn 42. Father, we thank you for revealing yourself to us through your written word and through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for loving us while we were your enemies. We thank you for rescuing us for, from the darkness and giving us spiritual life, for sealing us with the Holy Spirit and giving us the promise of eternal life through faith in your Son. We ask you, Father, if there's anyone here today that has not yet believed in your Son for their salvation, that you will transform their hearts and bring them to your to the saving faith today. And above all, we thank you, Lord, for your son who made our reconciliation and peace with you possible. We thank you, Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. <laughs>